Good afternoon. Welcome to a course Parallel R, which is organized under the auspices of EuroCC2 project. It is a collaboration of NCC Czechia and NCC Slovenia, which are the national competence centers in HPC. This uh, training is focused on different approaches to how the R code can be parallelized, going from local and single node approach with parallel package to multi-node parallelization with R and PI package. And the second day is focused on increasing computation efficiency by introducing RCPP for seamless integration of C++ code into R code. And a simple example of QDA usage will RCPP will be also shown. This will be tomorrow. Our tutors are Janes Pov from NCC Slovenia. Is, uh, Janes is a full professor of applied mathematics at the University of Ljubljana uh, in Slovenia. And since 2022, he's also the managing director of Rudolfovo Institute in Novo Mesto. Uh, his research focuses on developing state-of-the-art algorithms to solve hard computational problems, mostly from combinatorial optimization and data science. Janes will be your tutor today. And tomorrow, Tomáš Martinovič from IT for Innovations will take over. Tomáš has PhD degree in Computational Sciences from IT for Innovations, BSB Technical University of Ostrava. And from 2015 to 2018, he worked in a team focused on analyzing complex dynamic systems. And since the start of 2022, he's a team leader of a team which is focused on machine learning and AI and operations research with the defined objective of research and knowledge transfer into cooperation with industry. As I already mentioned, the course has two days, so two afternoons. Today, uh, we will start at 1 and at 3 p.m., and there will be a short break in the middle. And tomorrow, we will again start at uh, 1 and, uh, and at 3 p.m. I would like to thank you for attending, and with this, I will pass the speech to Yanis. So hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Karina, for this nice introduction. So as I mentioned uh, today, I will be your tutor and Tomas will be my assistant and tomorrow we will reverse the roles. Uh, I will just share my slides. Hopefully you can see them now. Uh, yes. Okay. So um, I will suggest it's a very short, very high level introduction to supercomputing, just that you understand where we will work and how we will work. And then very short introduction to R. Actually, our this course assumes that you have um, basic knowledge in R. So I don't plan to say a lot about this. And then we will start with the main two topics of today. So how to make... Uh, parallel code when you have only one computing node. This one computing node could be considered as also as your laptop or desktop machine, uh, which is also currently multi-core uh, machines. And then we will move to cluster, so to real supercomputer with many computing nodes, and we'll see how we can parallelize code if needed that will run in parallel across several computing nodes. Actually, uh, we decided with Thomas that it will be all the time in parallel, hands-on. So once we do something, you will be asked to try this immediately. So not to wait one hour before you start trying this, because in this one hour, I may, I may lose you in that time. Uh, and one more thing, so around 2 p.m., I plan short break. So that's about around 10 minutes so that the others who get lost can catch up in this time. And also I can take a glass of water in the meantime. Okay, so introduction to HPC. So here is a photo of Lumi. This is current largest public supercomputer in Europe. Uh, there are several of them, but this is currently the largest. A new bigger one will come next year in your two years in Germany. However, this is um Finnish supercomputer where Czechia is also a partner, if I understand well, in this consortium, in this Lumi consortium. However, um it has I think roughly 350 peta plops of uh computing um power and cost it roughly 300 million euros. So this 
is how supercomputer looks like from outside. If you come to this building, it is cooled building, and you can see many of these iron closets. However, how the supercomputing looks on this logical level, so how, what is the blueprint of supercomputer? Basically, you have, let's say, three, four main components of it. So, uh, the so I don't know which is the most important, but certainly very important component are computing nodes. So this is the part of supercomputer where computation should be done or usually are done. Uh, like you have a factory, and then you can see my mouse. These computing nodes are actually the production sites where the work is actually done. But then you also need to have warehouse or storage. So there we have this uh, network storage where the data from different computing nodes could be stored and accessed from other computing nodes. And then you have a lot of this internal logistic good connectivity. So this component should be very fastly interconnected such that um, computation from different nodes could be really done in parallel and also data input output operations could be done efficiently. Uh, and then you have this let's say front end part. So how you actually connect to them and you can connect to them a bit uh, through some login uh, nodes. These are servers which serve the customers, which serve us wants to connect and work on those machines. And there are also web servers we can access to these machines through classical SSH protocols or some different remote uh, window, remote desktop applications or using some web service or services. So today we will use kind of combination web service that will uh, support virtual machine running on a thing on a login node. Then you have also some other services. So, and we are on the left hand side of this cloud. So we access to this computer with our laptop, maybe even phone or desktop machine. And we will connect uh, initially through a browser to a virtual machine that is running on one of the login nodes. And then we will, through this virtual machine, uh, we'll connect to real login node directly. And from this login node, we will send around computing tasks. Uh, okay. So the main computing work is actually done on computing nodes. So here is a structure, how one very advanced computing node at this Lumi supercomputer looks like. You can see, I don't plan to go into details. You can see this supercomputer has um, one compute node. There are 2,560 of them. One of them has one AMD EPIC uh, CPU unit with 64 computing cores. And then beside this, it has also four GPU cards, each of them having some memory uh, processing units and so on. Um, so, and or additionally, this compute now has some, um, it's quite some fast memory, RAM memory that supports the CPU. Um, so this supercomputer are very high tech computing infrastructure, so very expensive. Uh, but it is, on the other hand, uh, one high tech on one side, but on the other side, very often we can still approach and use it in a very traditional, even maybe primitive way. So very often you need to use kind of terminal window approach to do the computations. And here is actually where we sometimes lose our students or our users because this learning curve is at the beginning quite steep because of this SSH approach. However, today we will skip this. So Tomas uh, prepared virtual machine that is accessible through internet browser. So you immediately come to RStudio ID where you can work 
almost the same as you can work on your laptop. Uh, so if you want to use supercomputer, uh, there are many of them which are publicly funded partially by national funds, partially by European funds. So here is a list of current beta and uh, how to say pre exascale computers. So beside Ostrava, there is also one in Slovenia, Bulgaria, in Italy, not one, many of them in each of those sites, uh, which are available to all research community in EU, actually to all researcher in the mem in the founding states of Euro HPC joint undertaking based on some, how to say, approval procedure. So you need to approve to get access. Either you submit a research project for which you need specific instruction or you uh, attend training course like you did today. But not all of them have are installed, mostly I expect that they have, uh, uh, but certainly I know that it is installed in Slovenia, in Czechia, uh, and for others, I didn't check if they have installed R with all necessary libraries. Okay, yes, as Karina mentioned, this short training, two days times two hours, is organized by two competence centers, Slovenia and Czechia, which are part of this European console, a network of competence centers for supercomputer. Here we try to, uh, you based on European funding, try to attract new people to use this infrastructure to so to speed or to improve their science to enable them to deliver better scientific results with this scientific infrastructure. But on the other hand, we also try to get on board people from industry, especially from, from small and medium-sized enterprises, because here the gap is quite big. And also this competence center deals with new talent attractions into this field uh, and so on. Okay. So now I finish with this introduction to HPC. I don't want to spend much more time. Now we go briefly to introduction to R. This will be also quite fast because most of the knowledge here is actually presumed. And then we move to the main points. So parallel R within one note and R MPI parallelization. Any questions so far? I don't see anything in chat. Otherwise, just remind me. Okay, so what is R? As I assume you should be uh, familiar with. So for me, this is the tool number one, the tool of choice whenever I want to do something with data. If the data is not too big, uh, so then R can handle this very efficiently. And uh, for R, it is important that um, so it's free, open source, um, enables all functionality that I need for my science and for my business. It is interpreted languages, language, as you know, and based on S programming language, which is which originated in 1970s of previous uh, century. So current version released a month ago is 4.4.0. Although very rarely I observe important improvement from one version to another. So if you have on your local machine a bit older version, I think the code that we will see today will still work on older version. If one find if you want to load current, there is a web page, CRAN uh, R, where R um, binaries of Windows executable are available, download it, install, and run it directly as R or using uh, some ID like R Studio. So for R, for me, it's important that it's free and open source. It has huge user community. This is really great. Whatever trouble you have, you will get in the user community answer trees. 
actually even chat GPT managed to, how to say, read all those forums and even provide you quite good support. If you don't want to browse the forums, you can very often get good answer, good ideas, good examples, even from chat GPT. Uh, yeah. So all high-end state-of-the-art advanced statistical methods are, almost all are implemented um, through different libraries, through different scientific sub-communities. So I can still repeat whatever I wanted to do with R uh, in statistics data science, I always could do it through R. Okay, but for some, at least for my students, for my undergraduate students, the learning curve is also steep, especially if they are in social science, then R is tough for them, natural science, engineering, are a bit, uh, how to say, easier with it. And R is also slow for large data sets. If you want to handle real big data, then probably R is no more appropriate. Although this Hadoop framework uh, has libraries that uh, enable splitting large data sets in smaller chunks of data that could be handled in parallel with R scripts. But I tested it and it does not work very well. Okay, just short overview also about uh, data types in R. So R supports virtually any type of data, uh, numbers, characters, logist logicals, um, and arrays could be virtually unlimited size. However, I think if you come so close to one giga, I think you can really find issues in practice. Uh, so simplest data formats are vectors of matrices of uh, um, which are mostly designed for numerical data. You can also have lists as another data type which can contain mixed data, mixed variables. And data frame is probably the most usual data format in R which enables adding additional metadata about the data and in its sense encapsulates a uh, rectangular data set. So data structures in R are we linear and quadratic. Uh, so linear it's a vectors uh, all should be of the same side uh, of the same type numerical or list. Uh, this is also linear one-dimensional data where you can put into the same uh, uh, data format different types. And then you have rectangular data frames or matrices are examples of rectangular data formats in R. So how to run R, you know, uh, you can do it directly using terminal window uh, that comes with R. So this primitive, uh, it's an interface, but since the very beginning, I use R Studio, which is an ID for R, and it is available as desktop application. Probably you all have it on your desktops. It is also available as R Studio Server, which actually runs on remote server and allows uh, accessing through a web browser. This is what we will actually do today. So this is our studio server that is running in a virtual machine that runs, I think, on a login note of um, Barbor or one of the supercomputers in Czechia. Uh, okay. So first task for today, for hands-on task for you today is to really run a or to go to our studio on the virtual machine provided by Tomas. And here you actually have a link where you can access it. Um, actually, I forgot to mention that those slides that I'm running uh, through this course are available on the Indigo web page. So you can download it all of them, sometimes you can even extract uh, code snippets from it. So if you would have 
lights, then there is active link here. So the shiny VSB.cz uh, is a link to this virtual machine. Uh, so you can either type it again yourself. If you have slides, click them, and then you should be able to come to this virtual machine. Now I will go there. So you should see something that I see here. Uh, Tomas, maybe you can mention, so they should obtain username or password or how, uh, what type of credential do they have? Yes. Hello, everybody. So I'm Tomaj Martinovic. Uh, you should receive the credentials for, from Lucia through email. Uh, I think most of you got it on Friday. And you just use those credentials to log in. So your username is something like dd-23-116-8. ID. They go from 80 to 1. 114 and the passwords were randomly generated for everybody so yeah you, uh, but you yes. should receive them in the emails so here's the point when you need this so try to find this email if you missed it and then when you connect to this shiny.vsb.cz uh, so here is address again you will be asked to enter this username and password and please, maybe you put in chat uh, a sign that you managed to do this. I'm trying to find. Uh, okay. Some question of Thomas managed to. Okay, some of you. Great. It works under two. Um, so, based on your comments, it seems that um, most of you managed to get in to this R studio. I have a still any problems so far okay maybe i wait a few more seconds and then i continue okay Okay, any problem so far I see, let's say six, seven positive reactions. Uh, eight, nine, 10. Uh, so if somebody has an issue, has a problem with accessing this shiny virtual machine, then uh, please write this in chat and Thomas will try to help you in parallel. Otherwise, so I assume, huh, you are here. So do you see my browser now? Do you see my R studio now? Uh, yes. Because I should be sharing my screen. So you should see my R studio. Uh, okay, and then the first step, once you are here, okay, I'm a bit further. Uh, first step here is that you, clone the data, the uh, data and code that is prepared from you from GitHub. So it is uh, done here. Here's the instruction. So you start as new project and then you have a version control. So file new project and then version control and then git and then this repository you should copy here 
this link here. So, sorry. Um, this, you copy it here. So parallel are May 2024. Or you click and if you are have slides. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for providing this in chat. So copy this uh, address here. And here you just name this project however you want. And then you create project. This creation will make also cloning the project. So please sign somehow that you manage. So I see Kiati said, yeah, did it great. Nice to see you, Kiati. Uh, anybody else? Okay, Lorenzo managed to do this. Okay, great. So it's important. If you don't do this, then the rest of the work will not work. Uh, then you can just passively follow. So if you don't manage to step those two steps, so get to this virtual machine and then uh, cloning the project from GitHub, then you will suffer till the end of the training. Okay. Okay, so now I assume, hopefully not too soon, that you see somewhere on your home, if you go down, right down, so bottom right, you should see here I have actually several of them because I do several tests. Maybe I can delete this one. So you should see right at the bottom, parallel are May 2024. I have also from January instance um, because uh, this is my code from January, but you should see only this parallel R. Okay. Uh, Oh, let's continue. Maybe we should end, maybe we should provide some questionnaire how far you are. And now let's try, you can play however you want. So this is now just our studio as on your, almost as on your uh, local machine with all libraries that you will need today and tomorrow already pre-installed. You just need to load them. And now you can open you can open in this uh, installed folder, parallel R May 2004. You go there and you go to R, folder R. And you can see several R scripts and also one S batch script, which will be needed at the end. So, just open or click our script part one. These are the basic scripts for today. And here is the code that um, you will need. So this is code that works also on my laptop. So in the beginning, I check whether I'm on my laptop or I am on the cluster. So, and now you can, if you see, still see my computer, you can just try setting your uh, working directory to the folder where that you cloned from GitHub. So if you make there, you should see, you should be in this parallel R May 2024, and you can see the date and this type of, of folders. Okay, now I go back to my slides. So here is just simple uh, example, uh, very simple probably for you. So creating some data randomly, and then we'll do some basic 
analysis shortly just to see if everything works fine here. So with this first part of the code, you create a data frame where the central data is 1,000 rows and three columns. You have three columns, one is group, one variable is the group, then you have integers and reals. You just execute and store this data locally in the folder data. So this should work and then you clean the uh, working space. So it is in the first part here. So it should work for you. If not, do not hesitate to, 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 to ask. Okay. Uh, next slide here. So we save store the data. Now we will load it and we will do some uh, simple operation. Maybe I can yeah even skip this part. So if you go next, uh, yeah, I should somewhere load it again. Uh -huh. Where is this loading part? No problem, I have it here. Uh, okay, I thought this copy there, okay. So we just load the data, read table, and then see how the data looks like. It has three variables. One variable is group, the other variable, second variable, second column is int integers, and the third column is reals. And then of course you can raise rows, columns, and so on. And then you can also see what are your groups. So we see that we have groups A, B, C. And next simple question is oh, Gana, um, Gana, sorry, but could you copy that also into the chat? So sure, sure, yeah, thank you. That comment. Okay. Yeah, it's always good if you if you don't need to type yourself. Okay, now suppose we want to make this simple analysis with different ways. It is uh Example, this example will lead us now to apply uh, functionality so to the family of scripts built around apply uh, script, uh, which is one of the one of the centers for later parallelization. So we need to be familiar with using apply so that we can later use parallel apply different variant of it. Okay, so here, if you try to make this simple analysis, so for each group, we try to count how many examples are in this group and what is the mean value of second column in this group. We can do it differently. So here we can see that uh, with very primitive, with for loop, this is a list eff efficient, uh, but could be done for small data sets. So we can get this, uh, we can get this uh, summary table, this follow-up. And I think this script is ready here. Okay, it is here. Uh, so you can do it, run it. And we can see that here are the results. Since I don't fix the seed for random number generator, probably you get different values. Um, but uh, this is how it should look like. Then, you know, I love R also because there are so many different ways how to do the same things. One, we could do it also this way. I go to slides and show it here. 
So we can use it using split aggregate or as supply functions um, from the prior library. Uh, so this is alternative. So you can, um, I would say one alternative is to use apply as apply comes later. So this is apply function, which uh, returns um, a list at the end. Uh, I come later to apply again, if you're not familiar, but this apply function enables you to do the same. So what we do, we first make split. So we split according to group. So we get three uh, sub data frames um, based on the values of group. This is actually a list of three frames. And then on each of them, we apply some function. And this function is actually function which returns mean value of integers and length, so the size, the number of elements. So this is done here. So, so S is the split. You can see that we have actually a list of three data frames. There they are. Yeah. So for each value of group. And then we can apply. And also, okay, this transpose is that the frame is the same. And we get actually almost same result. So ABC and then the values. Of course, we can also add the names of the columns, but we didn't complicate here. And also we can do it with aggregate function. So aggregate integers according to group. Um, and function should be one's length and the other time it should be mean. So this is the third option, how to get the same report. Okay, this is just a motivating example that we need to consider apply function. But uh, so apply function are very closely related to this within node, so intra node parallelization. So when we talk about intra node parallelization, then maybe it's good to know how many computing cores actually we have available. Uh, so since this intranode parallelization will be strongly related with library parallel. So the library parallel is a classical library that comes with all basic installations of R. So uh, we need to load this library. This library then uh, enables us to check how many computing cores we have currently on the node that where we are available. So these are the cores um, that library parallel detects as computing cores, which are then candidates for workers in this parallel mode. So um, this script here on this slide um, is phrased from my laptop. So if we do the same uh, on our virtual machine, we get different results. Uh, let me see. Uh, if we check this uh, here, uh, how is it? Library parallel. Okay, I will. I will copy this to the chat so we can do it. You know, I planned a bit different flow of arguments, um, but since I come that far, I can provide you this. And if you copy this somewhere. You load this library, you can see how many cores you see. And on this note, this login note. So Thomas, am I correct? So this shiny virtual is running on one of the login nodes. Is this correct? Uh, no, it is a totally different node, but <laughs> it uh, has 32 cores. But yeah. I, actually, I thought that everybody should see just two of them, but it, it's fine if even 
like this, it should be okay. So uh, the, the node where this virtual machine is running, where this R is running, has 32 cores, while my laptop has only 20 of them. Uh, and if we check on this version of Windows, uh, if you go to Task Manager on Windows, you can see this is again print screen from my laptop. So my laptop has 14 physical cores, so two processors, and something like this. Uh, but uh, it has 20 logical processors. So this is a bit complicated. I don't plan, I'm not sure if I can explain all details about this hardware here. However, see, on my laptop, I have 20 logical processors, uh, and these are actually the cores that R is detecting as computing cores, which are then the basis for workers that run in parallel, within parallel library. So on the virtual machine that we are running, you have 32 cores, uh, but there you don't have this window support as I do have here. You should check it differently. Okay, so this is about the infrastructure that we are running. And now let's go back again to apply family. So apply family actually applies some function to elements of list, list of elements of data structure. Data structure should be, could be one dimensional or two dimensional. If it is one dimensional, then surely it applies this function to the only dimension. If it's two dimensional, then you need to mention uh, across which dimension the apply function is applied. So the function is applied. So X is the array or matrix and margin, if it is one, then the function that is here in the third parameter is performed across rows. So on each row of X, you perform this function. If margin is two, then the function is performed across each column. And then if the margin is C, it's a vector containing one and two, then the, mar then the function is applied on each element of the matrix, so it is if, the, if we have two-dimensional data structure. So we can use for function built-in function or we define our own function. Okay, so this is apply, but then we have, set apply, we have also L apply and S apply. Here is the difference. Um, the difference is mostly what is the output of them. I will come to this later. So this is one of the examples. I think it should be, they should be here in it, sorry. So in this first script, so R script part one, here you have uh, the scripts where you can play and understand the apply function. So here you read the data, if you have done so. So this is the data with 1,000 rows. And now if you want to compute mean value of each column, we have two numerical columns. So mean value of second and third column, you can use classical function column means, column means, and you get vector of length two containing those two mean values, but you can obtain the same by using apply. Of course, in this case, I would say call means is better, is faster, but in this case, uh, you can do this alternatively by applying function mean on, on columns. So on each column, because here, as I mentioned, I entered two, so it means this function mean is applied on columns. And here I take all the data frame, but the first column, because first column is uh, descriptive, is nominal, so we cannot compute mean value. And we get the same value. 
okay? And similarly for row means, we can compute the mean value of each row, so only the numerical part. So we skip first column because it is not numerical, it's not numeric. So we can compute the row means like this, or again with apply function, but here we apply again mean function across first dimension. First dimension means for each row. And we get the same. But of course, in this case, since we had 1,000 rows, we get the result vector of length 1,000. But we can also apply some function to all elements, not only to rows and but to all elements in matrix. And this could be done by applying and the dimension. He mentioned both dimensions, one and two. And here the function might be still mean, but of course the mean value of each component is just this component. Here I wrote my own function, which uh, just uh, makes squares. So this contains squares values of all. Of course, we could do it also differently, much faster probably, uh, but this is just to demonstrate what is possible. Okay, now let's continue. So uh, differences between apply, L apply, and S apply. So L apply, takes as input list vector of data frame and return only list. So this L at the beginning refers to output. Output is list, while S apply also takes one dimension, two dimensional data, but returns vector as output. So L apply returns list, and we can see this in the following steps. So here L apply and S apply. So if we compute, it is done here, and you have the scripts also here. Uh, there was a question, is parallel slur? No. This parallel uh, uh, works without slurm. So, so we will come to slurm at the end. Uh, so slurm is, let's say, uh, middle where scheduler that uh, schedules work across nodes and also across different uh, processes within node, but this parallel, to the best of my knowledge, works independently of Slurm. So it also works on laptop where I don't have any Slurm. Okay, so apply, I'll apply. Uh, you can see in this case, if we do just apply, then result is vector. If you do apply, then the result is list of two values. This is the only, so the type in first case is doubles, so vector of doubles uh, of numbers, and the second type is list. So L apply is this, and um, what about uh, S apply? So here we have also S apply. So actually here, we can test apply, L apply, and S apply, and we see the difference. So in the first case, we still get vector, now we get list, and now we get again a vector. So S apply is in this context equivalent to apply to turns vector. Let's see here. And so on, we can play with this, but so apply is one of the functionalities that we will use for parallelization. Okay, what now? We continue with slides. So these scripts I already demonstrated. Uh, and now we have one task that could be candidate to be around, to be done in parallel. Any issue so far? Um, so you have you have uh, the task. You want to create k random matrices of order n by n, and for each of those you want to compute their sum. So this is very basic linear algebra task. Uh, uh, I use this task because 
it could be done naturally with for loop, sequentially, but also purely in parallel, because if you create k random matrices, they are independent, so you can compute their sums just in parallel, purely in parallel. So here is um, the code. So n, in our case, will be 1,000. We could go further to 10,000, 5,000, but then you know, we are 30 here. So if everybody does on the same machine, you know, we all run our virtual machine on the same underlying machine. And if you all want to do some big matrix computations, then um, the virtual machine, the server, underlying server will be very slow. So that's why I choose those normal numbers. So we consider matrices of 4,000 by 1,000, and we can have only 60 of them. Okay, uh, so this code is now hidden in the second script. So you should open another, maybe you can close this or leave it open, and you should open in this folder R, R script part two parallel. Okay. Hopefully you are here now in this R3 part two. Okay, initially you need to prepare your working play. So I hope it is well prepared. So your data should be in this parallel R may slash data. Okay, otherwise you create it. So nothing, everything should be fine here. Uh, and for today, for the second part, we will use actually the following, uh, the following library. So for each, do parallel and parallel. So this for each and do parallel are closely related. Parallel is this basic library for parallelization. TikTok to measure time and pragma thing for random number generators and measuring time, I think so. So these are the libraries that I, we need. I hope they are installed. So Thomas, uh, I hope now you see if the installations were fine. So uh, all these libraries should be installed and now you load them. And you should come to line 29, again, to detect how many cores, so number of cores, how many cores we have, it should be 32. Are you here with me? If so, now let's, uh, now let's, compute the star. So for 60 matrices generate randomly, just using random, this is just purely uniform random distribution. So random matrix of order n by n and just compute sum and at the end we want to have all sums in this vector sum rand. And we just measure traditionally we did talk the time. So uh, mark those rows and run them. And let's say, so it takes two seconds roughly. What about you? How much time does it take for you? Maybe you report timings in the chat. Okay. Maria, uh, 176 seconds, this is a bit too much, I would say, did you? 
Ah, you're working on laptop, okay. Also fine. So Maria, I hope you forgot some decimal point. Great. So thank you. I like to see all responses. Okay, so this is traditional way, just plain for loop in R and uh, Okay, here you can also mention, so you can see, we can measure time with TikTok, or we can measure time with system time. This also measure times. You can also observe this. It should be roughly the same. So here you have three timings. Uh, this is when you do in serial, it's not so important, but later on in purely parallel, we will measure elapsed time. So the elapsed time is equivalent to a ball time. So how much time overall, according to wall time, so real time, uh, needed to complete this task. So in this case, so in my case, it was a bit faster than two seconds, but more or, more, more or less, we are in the same order of magnitude. Okay, and now I move back to my slides. Uh, now let's do the same, but using, uh, instead of four, we use alternative for four, and this is for each do loop. This for each do loop uh, looks like this. You need separate library for this. That's why we include it for each. Uh, okay, thank you, Maria. Uh, I see your comment. Okay, so for this, for each do, you need library to load library for each, which we did. And what we do, so instead of for, the syntax is for each, then you refer the set across each, this loop should run. And then you have between two percentage signs do. And this is just alternative for for loop. And the timing should be roughly close to all one. Let's do it. So again, two seconds. Also, system time is roughly two seconds. OK. Hopefully you are there. And now we come to libraries parallel and do parallel. So as I mentioned, parallel package comes with basic R installation. And uh, this parallel works great. So it is built upon apply functionality and this apply functionality is also very efficient. So if you can replace for loop with apply, this will almost surely work much better. Uh, so this parallel parallelize apply functionality. So instead of apply, it comes par apply instead of L apply list apply, it comes par L apply instead of S apply par S apply. Uh, So this is for parallel. So parallel works fine with apply. While if you want to parallelize for each do, this is a, a variant of for loop, then don't use parallel directly, but we use do parallel. Do parallel is kind of additional library needed to parallelize for each do. So do parallel is basically to parallelize for each. So for each plus do parallel library enables parallelization of this for each do functionality. And how to do this? So this for each do loop looks like here. So we have it here. You already know the syntax from previous example. And uh, if you want to parallelize, you simply do it uh, as before, but instead of here, instead of do, you write do par. Uh, so 
just want to come before we start trying this. Now that is um, do parallel. Uh, it's just one back end that enables how to parallelize for each do. So, so this do parallel library actually tells the library for each to use parallel library as a way of parallelization. There are other possibilities to parallelize um, beside parallel. Uh, I listed some of them here, just to know that, that this is not only parallel and do parallel, it could be done also differently. So on Unix system, do parallel actually uses multi-core functionalities. We have underlying, so also parallel is based on the lowest level on MC, so multi-core functionalities and snow functionalities. So there's a hierarchy of those libraries, but we don't go that far. We will just use do parallel to parallelize for each in parallel to parallelize apply. And later on RMPI to use um, uh, internode parallelization with MPI. Okay, I would make short break now. Let's say ten minutes of break, and then we continue. I will have a glass of water in the meantime, so I will be a few minutes away from my computer. If you have any issue, just write it uh, or say it now, and then we continue in ten minutes. So I suggest that we continue roughly 10 minutes far over. So we came that far. So we will try our first parallelization using for each and do parallel libraries. So here is how it can go. For the same task, we want to create, uh, we want to create several, um, want to, for 60 matrices over 1,000 by 1,000, we want to compute their sums, but in parallel using this script here. So what I did here, uh, this is also prepared in this R script file. So what I did here, I just replaced do with do par. So only three letters. And let me see what is done here. So this is the next. You can see in the comment, no cluster. So the point of this example is that there should be no difference because we haven't specified the cluster. So if you don't specify the cluster, then you get warning. Then you get warning and nothing happens. So basically no speed up. So if you mark this and run this, you will get, okay. You can see first warning, executing do par sequentially because no parallel back end was registered. This was just purely sequentially done and the time was again around two seconds. Okay, so uh, if you just go from do to do par, without specifying cluster, it will not work for you. But now, so we should specify the cluster. So although we are on the computing node, so we have this one computing node available and could do this intra-node parallelization, this is not done if you don't tell uh, R how to do this. So somebody is waiting in the waiting room. So Thomas, can you check this? Uh, Okay, so now register the cluster. So you have you can use you can register clusters. So you can basically assign workers. So course for this R session using two approach. So you can do this with do parallel. No, do parallel is a kind of higher level library compared to parallel, and the syntax to register cluster. This is a logical cluster, so you assign workers that are available to this session, to this for each do part, with simply make cluster. 
And this class here is actually handle is uh, object describing this cluster. And here in a parenthesis, you just specify how many cores you want to. You can just say all but one or all, but sometimes the first one is needed to somehow manage everything um, or any number between one and number of course available. This you create it, but this is does is not sufficient. You need then to register. So register do parallel cluster then actually makes this cluster available for, for each do par. And once you stop, you make stop cluster, or you actually can also do it differently. So this register do parallel, you actually, um, I would say, uh, starts parallel mode where this cluster is available. And you can go back to sequential mode. So this alternative way, how to stop the cluster. So we actually register sequential mode again, back. And here in between, we can then put this for each do par, and then it will run in parallel. So here is the code. Um, uh -huh, okay, sorry code will come in the next slide. So second option is skipping do parallel library, but use just this basic parallel library, which has very similar things. So register do parallel. So before we had create and then register. So we have here no object related to this parallel. We just register do parallel where we define how many cores. And then we don't need to stop cluster, we just register sequential back. Here we register parallel cluster, do what you want to do in parallel, and then uh, go back. So um, the first option we do parallel will in Linux actually use underlying snow library. Uh, while the second option will use in Linux multi-core library. And in Windows, they both use Snow library. Uh, okay, I see some issues now. Uh, Okay, Thomas, can you check what's going on? Uh, okay, let me see if it will work for me. Maybe I will have the same issue, although it didn't happen at home. Okay, this is option, no, first option one. So register, let me see what will happen because we haven't tested for many users in parallel this. Uh, Okay, could be that we all try to register same course. Um, okay. Oh, it's this weird because the teams are... Oh. Sorry, I don't understand you, Thomas. Yeah, well, no, that it is a little bit weird because uh, I think it should be yeah, fine, so... but yeah. Web server received an event response while acting as a gate. There is a problem with the one page you are looking for. I don't know what you say. Oh, okay. It seemed there was a problem, so I will restart the server. Okay, so we restart the server. We all need to. It will kick out everybody. Okay, yeah. Anyway. Uh, you know, uh, Sorry for this, um, but we just didn't test this with 30 participants. We tested only with two, with me and uh, Thomas. No, no yeah. like, like we had it last year and it was working fine, but uh, it seems that for, for whatever reason, everybody should have access to just two cores, but everybody got access to all 32 for, and then it got overloaded. Okay. Um, um, 
Okay, so now you will restart. So we need to log in again. Yeah. Okay. Okay, in the meantime, I will continue with slides and we will later come back uh, with these uh, hands-on examples. So here is the script, how to uh, register cluster with um, do parallel with option one. So you can see here we register cluster. Uh, actually here, we create and register. Here we just write what is the underlying functionality. Is it multi-core or snow? Just to see what is really happening with this high level uh, registration. And then um, we do, so we make here time measurements so system time. Uh, and the main functionality is for each do par. So this is the main functionality for each. We need now in parallel, execute, measure time, and then stop cluster. So I put stop cluster outside measuring time because creating and uh, uh, stopping cluster takes additional time, which essentially should not be measured when we compare this. However, we will see that um, for this size of problems, okay, sorry, I will now continue the second slide and then I will make those comments. So here, very similar, we just registered cluster with registered to parallel and registered to sequential. Uh, uh, I mentioned the difference before. And if we do this, so these are timings that I made before we started. Uh, so although I used uh, yeah, I will answer to this pragma later on. Uh, so those timings you just consider you just consider last column uh, and you can see although we use 32 cores, theoretically it should be, I don't know, 30 times faster. But here, because the examples are smaller, because of some overhead communication, we can observe only, let's say, factor 2.5 speed up. So we are 2.5 faster. But this is only the case when I was the only one. Once now we are all logged in, this scaling does not show anymore. Uh, but if we have bigger matrices, which are more time consuming, then the scaling would be observed much better, but uh, still we wouldn't reach 30. At the end, I have one example, which is perfectly parallelizable, where you can observe scaling factor almost the same as number of cores, but this is an artificial example, um, but this is really ideal. Okay, so thank you, Thomas, uh, for restarting. Let me see if this will work now. Okay, let me try again. <coughs> okay, I'm here. Okay. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Maybe it would be good if uh, in the command make cluster to just put two uh, hard coded right now instead the n cores minus one. Just uh -huh, to be so and on cores not to be thirty but to be thirty but to be two. You mean this? Uh, just 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 put two there. You know. Here you mean this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Also, everybody else, if everybody else, it, please to avoid. Okay, uh, we should load again those libraries. Okay, we should even install them again.
Okay. Now let me see if this works. Okay. Yeah. Okay, two warnings uh, are this, I don't understand them. Close the unused connection six and five, or oh, what this could be. Uh, okay, again, two. Okay, in this case, it was better. No warning. Okay, so timings here. Um, this for each do par. This here was a question, library. Why I need to uh, put library here? Because um, this was, I can't say all details. Uh, this is a bit experimentally, but you know, this parallelization basically on each computing core established new R session. And here we have this socketing type where actually some libraries need to be again loaded by each process. We have forking type and socketing type of establishing new processes on workers and this forking type gets complete uh, session with all libraries while socketing type not necessarily. And in this case, uh, although this, yeah, in this case, this library that are specific uh, for this task, I think for random generation, uh, needs to be installed on each computing uh, process uh, separately. I come later back to this. So this seems to work now. So this was all about parallelization with for each do par. So you need to register cluster and you need to do this for each do par. And uh, if some library is needed, uh, you need to provide, you need to load them, uh, uh, load them again on each process that is created with the uh, uh, cores that are provided. So this was for each Drupal, and now we have also parallel apply. So this is second part. So uh, this library parallel is based on low-level multi-core and snow libraries. I already talked about this. We have basically two top uh, ways of parallelization, socket and fork. I was just talking about this. So socketing um, actually uh, creates on each core available new R session, brings data there, but this R session is new. So also new libraries. So the libraries that needed there need to be again loaded there. Uh, so pros, uh, it works also on Windows. So each process is unit, so don't cross contaminate, uh, but works a bit slower, could work a bit slower. Uh, and what else? Uh, yeah, sometimes more complicated to implement. And yet the variables that are defined in your um, main session where you start, these, these are not visible there. So the working space is not completely copied to this uh, process, to this worker, which uh, is initiated on each core. While the fork type, it actually is faster. It copies all existing R session on each worker. So then we don't need to load libraries that need. We also don't need to load global variables that are visible in the main session. 
but this uh, forking approach of parallelization works only on four six systems, and this is currently still excluding Windows. So uh, if you do on your laptop, then you need to do socket approach, and this socket approach is implemented by using par l apply, so parallel l apply and parallel s apply, while forking type of parallelization can be done by MCL applied. This is how to say high level difference, different code. And this is now done here, quite simple. But to do this, uh, to do this, we need uh, to do it a bit differently. So how I manage to transform the task such that apply function is useful. So basically I um, apply, I create function sum. This function sum creates random matrix of order X and by N, uh, yeah. So I just put dimension and then it returns sum of this matrix. Uh, is it, uh, okay, hopefully it's fine. Yeah, you see. So then I provide, so I just put input. So I replicate number and then is the dimension of matrix K times, I have K matrices, and I apply on this vector of numbers N function mat sum, which actually for number N replicated, creates matrix and return its sum. This is how L apply or S apply could be used. This is L apply, S apply, and then later on also par. So this is here, CR version, but here on this side is parallel version. And for the forking, okay, for the forking, we use MCL apply, and for the socketing, we use par L apply and par S apply, and we need for the socketing the create cluster and stop it uh, by providing use make cluster and providing type socketing, sock, sock, And for the MCL apply, which is forking type, we provide info about cluster in the function MCL apply, where we define how many cores you want to have. Uh, okay, so imagine we get this error. Uh, now let's try to run it here. So this is just classical apply this function. Now classical apply as supply. This should work. No cluster here. And now uh, replace here number of cores with two, as Thomas suggested. And here again, socket in type, here again, instead of n cores, use two. And again here, uh, okay, the socket in type still reports some warning, but manages to execute. And again, here two. Okay, at the end we can see what times do we have. Uh, and yeah, there is a difference, not very big. Okay, here in this case, when we have two cores, actually we have two times faster. So if you go to 30 cores, you will not observe that fine scaling. Yeah, Ismail, this is single node parallelism. Yeah, this is um, applied also. This could be applied also on your working desktop, working machine, uh, laptop, and so on, or on any cluster. If you go to single node or login node, although on login node, you usually should not do this. Uh, okay, this is since we are a bit late with time. 
here are the results. So this elapsed column is relevant. You can see that part L apply, part S apply, and L apply. These are the socketing and forking type of parallelism using parallel library are two times faster because um, you have two cores. I mentioned if you go to 30 cores, if you use all cores available, you will not observe 30 times because of some communication overhead. Here is very simple. Maybe you can try it on your laptop later on. Uh, so you just uh, make system sleep. You just, uh, the only thing you do is just to ask worker to sleep for one second here. So this is a function, no input, just sleep for one second. And if you do this in parallel, or just so here is serial and then MCL apply, this is this fork type or other type of parallelism, you will observe very good parallelism. Uh, depends on how many cores you have. I'm afraid to run 50 cores, 25 cores, but maybe five cores will work for me. And we'll run it now, you see. Okay. It still runs always the five was too much. Uh, okay, I believe it. So this is intra note, one note, okay, single. So we have five seconds if it is, if you have 25 seconds, if it is purely sequential, and five seconds if it is. Parallelized with MCL apply, forking type of parallelization using five cores. Okay. So this is one node, intra node parallelization. And uh, here are some other timings, you know, um, at home with different numbers. So basically, we can observe speed up, and the speed up would be better if the tasks are to say better for parallelization. So these tasks are not actually not so bad because we create and generate generate matrices independently. But uh, some uh, overhead, especially turning values back and creating these workers takes some time. That's why we don't have perfect uh, scaling up. Okay. I'm repeating this, uh, and now let's go to the last part. Is there any question here? Okay, so I see some communication here, but it seems that Thomas is handling this in parallel, so thank you. Okay, and now last part is parallelization with RMPI. So R MPI is actually R interface to MPI message passing interface. This is classic library to enable communicating between different cores inside different computing nodes. So this is now inter node. So parallelization that incorporates many nodes. Also our example will uh, cover this. So, uh, it is for distributed memory parallelization in our framework. And uh, it actually enables this classical parallelization that is relevant if you really have supercomputer with many computing, not, not just only one as we used so far. Uh, so our MMPI is already installed, but it is it must be installed on computing nodes, not on your virtual machine. If you try here, let's say library, our MPI, you will see it is not installed. Even if you try to install this installation, it will not work. But actually, we don't need it here. This 
uh, library is needed on each computing node that is started, that is engaged in the computation that we create. Okay. Uh, so few basic comments which could be observed also on uh, classical MPI, if you do MPI programming with Fortran or, 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 or C, you observe this command. So com size, this first comment returns the numbers of active processes in current computing task or job. You create computing task with several processes, how many of them are currently active? And then rank, rank is the unique ID of processes active in current uh, job. So it is between zero and size minus one. And then also processor name, it gives you the name of compute node where the current process is running. So these, there are many more comments, but these are the comments that I will use later today. Okay, uh, so here is look one example, so called hello world example uh, for this RMPI. So what we try to do, we try similar things as before. We try to create n times n random symmetric matrix and compute smallest eigenvalue. This is one of the basic linear algebra computation that we very often use in numerical linear algebra uh, tasks. And so this will be the task. So this code here will be executed by each worker that will run in parallel. And these workers will not be only within one compute node, but will be running on different computing nodes. So uh, the code should be uh, the same for the worker and for the organizer of work. Uh, so we have, let's say, main worker, which organizes and uh, which do the basic work and then pure worker, which does only computation. So how I do, uh, so here we decided to make only matrices of small size only 30 by 30. And we just see uh, what is the size, how many workers we have, what is the rank, and what is the host, we always ask. And yeah, we first run library RMPI. If we try this on current session, it will not work because current session is a weird machine on logging out. Uh, so we run this, this code is run then on computing now. And what we do, if rank is zero, it means this is the, how to say, main process. This main process just uh, create, just create uh, how the output will look like. So the main process just um, create uh, on the, just print into consola, but the consola here is actually a file where all outputs are printed it put into this output file the following text. So size, so this is the header of the report. You want to create a report with different columns. The first column will be what is the size. So what is the number of active processes? What is the current rank? Who is the hosting? Who is the host compute node and what is then the maximum eigenvalue that we compute. And in this first process with rank zero, we compute nothing. So we can return not a number. And then we compute uh, this value, well, the size, rank and hold. So this is the only work that is done by the process with rank zero with the main process. All other processes have to do computations. So, uh, this is just, this is not so important. You just want to see where we are. Um, this is just for testing. The main part is we create matrix of order n by n differently. 
um, could be also different syntax. So this is a matrix. Then here we provide that the matrix is symmetric, and then compute maximum eigenvalue. And then we print with a Linux function cat, we print uh, to standard output, which is this output file, the size. So what is the current number of processes? What is the current rank? Who is my host? Who is the host of this process? And then uh, what is a here? Yeah, this maximum eigenvalue, and then go to new line. And this should be done on each process. If we have 10 computing nodes, each having 32 cores available, then we have 30, 320 workers, and each of those workers should do the worker zero, this part, and all 319 workers, this part. Okay, so this is the code. But how to make, how to initiate, initiate that many workers and uh, convince them that they work in parallel. So here, what is done here, this is R, this is R script, but now I need also to create description of job. So we need to create code that Slurm, uh, manager of computing tasks will understand and will do this in parallel. So uh, this, R code is now stored in R NPM master slave R. So this is our script. While this job is created in another file with uh, host fix as a batch. So it is executed then by, by, um, by Linux here. Uh, and this description is then in another sbatch file, this job RMP master state. So this is the general script where we described how to create parallel workers, how many of them, where will be output, how to denote them and so on. While the content, what should be done within each worker is hidden here. So those two files I prepared for you and those two files should be in a different folder now. This is now very important. Uh, so be careful. Okay, so here is the, the content of this as batch of this uh, uh, as batch file. So this is a classical syntax of every batch. So you should first uh, see with um, shell to use. And then um, with this second line, what needs will be exported, and then how you will allocate nodes. Here you specify the number of job RMPIs, the number of number name of the job. And here actually, uh, this is uh, I think. Uh, syntax from Ljubljana, the syntax in your case is a bit different. So the partition is not wrong, is a bit different. So this is from another cluster, but the code that you have on your folder is appropriate. So in which partition of the cluster, because clusters have different partitions, which partition to use, how many nodes you want. So um, the cluster that we will use is quite big, what I recommend two nodes, uh, and how many tasks per node. Here we can use as much as we can, so maximum number of computing cores that are available in each node, and where to put the output. The output will be in subfolder logs, and here will be the name. So the name of the output will actually be the ID of job dot out. And then what is then efficiently done, we should load uh, this open MPI compiler, we should load our module. And then what we do, finally we run. So this is done on each process. We then on each process run. So as run, we run this R script. So we run R script, which R script this master state that you prepare. 
So this code here actually initiates this number of processes times this number of nodes, that many workers in parallel on, and on each of these worker, they execute this R script. But how to run it? It's very important now that you first need to create the following, the following, um, or maybe Thomas, is it already created? Oh, the, it should be the mau directory is there and they uh, do not need to use this command. It is in the scripts. So... Okay. Okay. Maybe you explain us because this is, uh, let's say, really uh, basic, but I think you prepare some scripts how to, how to, how I, so you basically need to have in uh... this file those two scripts which are essential. So maybe you can explain how this could yeah. be done. Sorry, Anna. So first, uh, they should mount the the folder actually. So yeah. you just okay. go to the terminal so, and so, run. Uh, so terminal left bottom terminal, yeah. and you run what I put in, into the chat, so the script slash mount Barbara. And then to log in to Barbara, you can use script slash login bar Barbara in the terminal. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so you don't need to do run my script because Thomas much more user friendly prepared the script. So you need to to copy this script mount barbar and login barbar you need to copy in this terminal window that you have in our studio you know here left bottom no. i don't have those scripts i have basic scripts so i first mount and then i log into barbara but you should have the same results now so here you can see that we are now in this terminal window, we are now on Barbara cluster. So please respond. If it worked for you, do you see the same? Are you in Barbara cluster? Okay, Lorenzo is fast. Christina also, Patrick, Ray. And I think now they, they also should uh copy that uh, as by script and the R script to the, to the mount folder. Actually. Okay, but this is done not on the cluster, but this is done on this R. Uh... Uh, well, one way how to do it is also in that uh, files explorer that have the, they have in the right, lower right part. Uh -huh. so, okay. You mean you right just, bottom here? Yeah, 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 right bottom. Yes. So okay, so the the so, the easiest way is if you go one level up and copy just the whole folder. I think. I see. Okay. Um, if you're in home, you need you, to you copy. select the folder. Uh, yeah. The, this R. Go. Oh yeah, yeah, or or like that. Okay. Oh. And then in uh, when you click on more on the upper yeah top, uh, here right, and yeah. copy you can do copy two or copy two yeah this is also good and then you go up and you copy to mount yep so you all have this you see all this folder mount M N T. Uh, but it's copied there. If if you mount it beforehand, the Barbara it should actually also uh, appear in the Barbara. Uh, I think you need to save inside of the folder, like 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 this. Just just click save now. Yeah, it doesn't break. Uh, okay. Oh, is this? Okay, 
Maria, can you write us what is what kind of message you get? Okay, now I get it. Oh, okay. Okay, amount. Right. I see. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, maybe it's better if you do it the following way. So you need to copy those two files from R. You need to copy this job and this uh, R script, R MPR master state. You need to copy with more. So copy and then. So copy to, I don't use it very often. Copy to, okay. Okay, then maybe one by one. Probably you did it already, you know, this is. Okay. It seems that we have some issues here. We are almost at the end. So the last thing that we need to bend. So you need to copy each of them. Maybe you go one by one. So copy. No copy to, so it should be copy to. You can also open it and save it differently. This could also work with trivial to copy to. Okay, now I go so one by one to mount and save it here. And already exists, and I will say yes, and then so on. So you need those two. So job as batch and this master slave R. Those needs to be in the folder mount. Correct, Thomas? Yep. Okay, so you need to see in the folder mount what I see now. So this is on this virtual machine, but since this folder is mounting on Barbara, it is also there. If you now go to this terminal window, bottom left, and do ls, you should see those two files. So job and RMP master slave. You should see them. If you don't, then uh, and it will not work for you. So Maria created file, home mounted file. Okay, which file you created? Those two? So job and RMPI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so no, I asked a... Maria to create any file there because uh, she got an error while mounting, but usually this error happens when you already has uh, uh, are, uh, has something mounted in the folder. Uh, other possibility is try running like sudo umount. Uh... Okay, so Bar Maria, okay. Um, it seems that you are on the track back. So Maria, you manage, if you type ls, you see those two files on Barbara now. Yeah, like this is the trickiest part of, of, of this setup. Yeah. So if you do an S, so huh, you have to copy them, but well, it should, so you should, after copying them to mount, you should then mount, no. No, 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 you should mount beforehand because no. uh, when, when you mount no. afterwards, it, it's, it will get over the okay. folder, got, gets overwritten by the home directory from Barbara. So we need so to what about the others? It seems that Maria is having challenges. What about the others? Does anybody manage to do so? To copy those two files to MNT file uh, folder and then, so before mounting it and then copying it. So, you know, we are running now 
in parallel, partially we are doing some copying files on this virtual machine, our studio, and then in parallel, we are on the cluster, on the login out of the cluster of Barbara. Yeah, okay, so Lorenzo, great. What about the others? Great. Great, even Maria has it now. Okay. Okay, so it seems that at least three of you, four, okay. Well, you are 30, so I hope that also the others. Great. Okay, and now if you manage to step over this uh, obstacle, this is reasonable obstacle, then we can do the following. Okay, so this connection mounting was done with the scripts of Thomas. And then all is needed is that you run this job. Okay, maybe you can open now this uh, job RMPI. It opens here in the editor. You see probably my, I don't know if you can. So if you open in the editor, yeah. So this is the script that I prepared for here. Actually, I see that we don't need compiler anymore. Uh, specify. This was for another cluster. So here we are on partition QCPU of Barbara. And actually here I use 10 nodes, but I suggest two nodes. Uh, and we have 36 processes per node. So this is the number of uh, cores that I think available on this partition. So this is the code that is actually organizing overall job. And now all that you need to do is to run to S batch, S batch, and then run this job description, which is job. Okay. So now you just run it. I will see how many of you managed to do this. RMPI, RMPI, where is this test? RMPI, at least I see uh, four times RMPI. Ah. Uh -huh. Some of the of you didn't change to two, so keep ten. Okay. Okay. So another right now there is quite a lot of open nodes <laughs> for you on the cluster. I should, so... yeah, yeah, many of you managed to do this, so I'm happy to see. But I'm not happy that you didn't manage to change to two. So you you are now running on ten compute nodes. Let me see if this is done already. Yeah, it seems that all RMPI tasks are finished. Not, not yet. Are this waiting for allocation? So you can see here, these are your tasks, our tasks. Let me see, SQ is showing our Q list. Okay, then still it should be done now. Okay, now if you wonder if there is already a result, you can type SQ and wait that your is empty. Uh, but if you're not sure which one was yours or if it's finished or not, you can go to a folder. You know, you are in folder M and T, 
And in this folder, you should have also subfolder logs. I have several outputs, but you should have probably only one. And this is the latest one. And you, if you open it, you can see the following. You know, since I, I use only two compute nodes, it means altogether I have 72 processes available and then zero process did only uh, report not a number and it was running on computing node, CN means compute node number 72. And then process number 36 ran on, seven, no, this was 71, this 72. And the value computed within this process with number 36, this small maximum eigenvalue was 16. So, so we can see in all rows we have 72, 70 processes. Here is the ID. So in this second column, there should be all IDs between 0 and 71 in different order because different workers take different time, although they do the same job, but because we use random numbers, there is slight variation uh, how they manage to report the results. So this is then the result. This is a typical uh, way. So you get results instead uh, of the into terminal window. It is reported in object output in folder that you specify, and then you usually post process. You always show the uh, computation such that the results are stored in one file that you then import in post process results. Okay, uh, where are my slides? I think uh, this is what you managed to do. Here is also a code which we could run without slur. We could run parallel RMPI code also directly from RStudio. If RStudio would be run on compute node where RMPI would be installed. In our case, our, MPI, our studio is run on this virtual machine where our MPI is not installed. Uh, so we could not run it here, but maybe you play with it at home. So it is three and seven minutes. So I'm seven minutes late, but uh, I would stop here. I'm waiting for your comments. Yeah. So thank you, Thomas, for all this support. You are very obviously precious. Uh, You're welcome, Yanis. Uh, yeah, if you change NTAS per node to eight, then you will have eight times. So it means that you will not exploit full node. You will just use eight cores from each node, and you will still use that number of nodes that you have, but on each node you will use only eight cores. So, um, thank you very much, Yanes, for the tutorials. Thank you, Tomas, for helping with the chat. And uh, if uh, there are no more questions, then we can. Uh, have it closed for today but don't forget there's tomorrow and we are very much looking forward to seeing you again and yes we will issue certificates okay so thank you for your attendance uh and yes yeah, see you tomorrow where the rules will be reversed or the opposite good afternoon everybody so i'm Tomasz Martinovic. Was there already yesterday, but today I will be leading the session. So I'm glad Jan has introduced most of the concept yesterday. So I think we can skip like the whole HPC stuff and and so on. We will use the exactly the same environment as yesterday. So you can log into the shiny.vsb cz slash out. I will put it into the chat. Oh, that's not right. 
Uh, I think everybody of you logged in yesterday, so I hope there will be no trouble with that. If you have any trouble logging in, let me know. Uh, today, we will have a little bit different approach uh, to the optimization. So Janes yesterday showed us uh, how we can speed up the execution by running things in parallel. And today we will focus on how to easily introduce speed up the code by using the C code we, with our R sessions. Um, for that, we will use the RCPP package. And there are several helper functions to, to make it really, really, really easy to use this C with R and at least to my knowledge, it is the simplest way how to integrate C to different language from many languages I seen and experienced. Uh, so uh, I'm really glad about that. And we will see how we can do it kind of, you know, uh, in the part as part of the script where the compilation, everything takes then the time in that execution. And then also how to build a package that will actually be executed CUDA code. And for that, we will use um, our Barbara cluster again. Uh, for that CUDA code, I will try to explain as much as I can. I have pretty good understanding of how it works. But my point there is mostly to show you that uh, you can for once leverage things like CUDA even with this uh, with the R and RCPP. And second thing, uh, may pr probably a little bit show you the and explain you the way how I've done it because I did not actually write the CUDA code. I uh, have very basic understanding of to have write the CUDA code, but still I just could find this code that uh, solve one issue and could just change parts of that code in a way that I now can execute it from R. So I think that that is like the main point to somehow today introduce you these things and show you how you can use them uh, so, so you do not here or you you are aware of, of of those possibilities because I've seen before in se several European projects that people had some R code and they wanted to speed it up or use that with uh, GPUs and instead of just rewriting a small part of the R code they for example rewrote the whole package into the Python what really doesn't make sense to me honestly and. Uh, so I think it's really good to understand that there are even these possibilities, how to speed up code how and how to work with R. Okay, so now first things, when you open the shiny VSB R Studio in your browsers, what I would like you to do is actually go to the folder parallel R that uh, you already cloned yesterday from Git. And then open the project here. So when you click here on this parallel air may 2024.air project, it will ask you, do you want to open the project? You will click yes. We are still in the same interface. <laughs> But one difference is that you will have this Git tab here. <laughs> and this uh, partially important uh, because I would like you to pull the update of the Git. You, you should uh, got some new files and update of the presentation for today. So then when you go again here from the home folder, when I go to the parallel R May 2024, 
then to the second day folder there is the presentation folder and you can open the presentation that i will shortly go over so um, you are not really required to do that but you may okay i will start with a short presentation i and then i will rather explain things over the code as i feel that's uh, better and at least i feel more comfortable with that so as i already started we will be now working today with the rcpp package it is originally developed by dirk edel Bittel and roman francois roman i think and it allows this really very easy integration with R and C++. It allows also the loading the C++ code in interactive session. It has this whole work to help creating packages with RCPP. And there are many, there, there is quite a, a lot of packages written around RCPP now to help also with some more advanced mathematics, for example. So what we'll go over today is this part when you, we will show how to use the CPP function call. And that means you just write very plain C code function and RCPP do really most, uh, they will take care of most of the stuff that you, that is just cumbersome, I would say. And you do not, uh, exactly necessary need to do it but like you need to do it in c but it could be automatized as it's shown with the rcpp because those headers can be kind of done automatically the compilation linking and everything uh, just works of most of the time with rcpp and is very magical in my opinion if somebody wants to see more of the process of what the what the cpp function does you can uh, also write the C++ function and source it by calling source CPP. So I see I have a mistake here. There should be source, not source. <laughs> and uh, then when you add the variables through, it um, actually also show the whole process, what is happening with the, all those linking and so on in the background it, it will be outputted into this standard output of the terminal of the r console and then we will also see this example of how to create a package with c c plus plus v with the cuda so there are some other advantages or some other bonuses around features around the RCPP. So for example, there is this C, uh, RCPP syntactic sugar, what actually means that you can write functions that looks very much the same as the R functions in some cases. And I did not put it into the library because I thought I will just show you. So here are some links if somebody wants to learn more about the RCPP because there is quite a lot and we will we could spend several days if going into the details uh, but when I just I think we'll start with this mot motivation in the RCCP sugar so uh, here is a function that is adding two vectors together in a C syntax so you can see that is quite a lot of uh, uh, text or you know code, and uh, it's uh, it's written also in this really original way how to write the C codes for the R. So you are sending actually the pointers. Uh, but um, you can imagine that these are just the pointers in the memory that tells the computer where actually you know, the object is in the memory. And then you need to change them into the numeric vectors from those pointers so that they are initialized here. Then you are uh, figuring out the size of those vectors. 
you create a new vector. Uh, what is this x y zero zero one and no ah okay sorry this is not just adding of the vector this is if else statement <laughs> so then we define some some character some helper. Uh, scholars that are zero at the beginning and then we go over the vectors and if x is less than y what is the condition here then we the result is, uh, is x squared and if uh, in other case it is minus y squared you know and we, we can see this is quite as i said lots of code in r we can do that very easily we just having the statement if else x is less than y do the x square or and else minus y, y square and thanks to rcpp instead of needing to write all of these cumbersome code in c you can actually write just this thing uh, that the output of the function okay so one thing in C is that you need to state also the type of the output uh, variable and also types of the input variables. So here you say that the output is numeric vector. The input is our numeric vectors. Uh, RCPP know what to, how to how to handle those. And you can write the exactly the same statement as in in R. You know, you just need to write the return here and uh, use this. Uh, oh, this is not the dash and comma. No, I forgot how is this called. A semicolon, right? <laughs> so this is the RCPP syntactic sugar. And you can see how it can be very helpful in, in some cases. Uh, I think on this slide there are just things that I already uh, said before and uh, so I will go next and now to use the RCPP in R you need to install a package of course and this process is that mainly for when you are creating the package. So I would stop the presentation for now, go to the code and return to this one when we start working on the second part. So now everybody can go to the Shiny uh, and you can Okay. I, I seen the question that Darutin is asking that there is RCPP and RCPP 11. Uh, to be honest, I haven't heard or about the RCPP 11. So I think you you are fine with the RCPP because from, from the name, I would expect that RCPP 11 is uh, taking into consideration the C++ 11 standard, but I'm pretty sure that you can define uh, you know, you, you can tell compiler to to use the standard anyway, and it is written somewhere in, in the guides of the RCPP, so that doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, but I, I don't know, maybe there are some more differences that I'm not aware of, but RCPP is fine. <clears throat> so now, when we go back to the Shiny, we can open the second day, and I would start here with the Mandelbrot. And now I can feel that probably we don't take into consideration really well the presentation order. So I will go back to the presentation for a little while. And today, all of the uh, explanation I will do on computing 
computation of the Mandelbrot set. It is relatively simple thing, but it has uh, some nasty drawbacks in a way that we are working with complex numbers. <laughs> but it, it should be fine, I think. Uh, the Mandelbrot set uh, actually, you know, is uh, computed by this function. So where we iterate over Z uh, and we go to the Z squared plus C where C is a complex number corresponding to the point coordinates. So just to make this um, simple for others to imagine, I will open the Wikipedia on the complex numbers. And for those who do not remember anymore, complex numbers have two parts. One is the real part and one is the imaginary part. And for us, the important part is that we can just uh, describe them uh, on a, on a two-dimensional graph where on x-axis will be the real part, on the y-axis will be the imaginary part. So we will have these coordinates A and B. Yeah, we will not complicate it any further. <laughs> uh, so now imagine then also I will open the Mandelbrot set definition. Um, uh, what we are actually doing is computing uh, this Mandelbrot set, we are iterating at each corresponding pixel. We will do this for each corresponding pixel. So each pixel has these coordinates in the real and imaginary part of the complex numbers. And that will be our initial point. And then we are just adding that um, again to, to, to the value of the Z. Uh, and if we go over, so when the, here like the distance of that complex number is more than two, then we return the iteration in which uh, this distance was crossed. And if we do not cross it in this maximal set of iteration that we define, then we just return the maximal, maximum iteration number. So, I hope I'm making it clear enough. So do understand what I'm trying to say and how, how this works. <laughs> One more thing, like this an, uh, a, 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 B, S, uh, Z on the complex number is actually complete, computing this distance of the vector of the A, B. Make it really simple. And here we can see how the function will be, will be defined. So uh, to this z, we give the coordinate c. And as I said, then we just iterate uh, to or from one to maximum iterations. And in case the z is crossed, we just return the iteration in which it was crossed, and then we return maximum iteration. So. It's very simple. I don't see any questions or raised hands, so I think everybody understands how this is computed. Now we can get to the code. I will make it a little bit larger for you. So to compute the whole image of the Mandelbrot set, we need to define several arguments. The first argument is the resolution of the image. That means how many pixels we actually want. We could do that for X and Y separately, but in this case, we are setting the X and Y to, to be the same. So we will get a square. Uh, here I have it defined to 1000. And my maximum number of iteration I'm setting to 100. Then we need to define actually what are the coordinates of, of that image in our complex uh, plane. So we are starting at uh, the position where real is minus one 
0.5 and the imaginary part is minus one. That is the left bottom part and the upper right part will be 0 0.5 for the real and imaginary will be one. Uh, then we have here the definition of the Mandelbrot function. We already seen it in the presentation. So I think that is pretty clear, very simple. And to compute the whole of the picture, we actually need a little bit more of the code. So we are, we'll create a function that will compute the whole picture in a for loop. And for that, we will send resolution inside the maximum iteration, those left, bottom left and upper right coordinates. And to actually find out what this number C should be at each position, we need to compute uh, yeah, their, their values. So first we will compute uh, what is the difference of the left bottom to the upper right. So we do the C max minus C min uh, and we will get this difference. Actually in both our cases, the answer is two. Yeah? So we can see here minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. So 0 0.5 minus minus 0.5 is two and one minus minus one is also two. So here in this part, the, these numbers will be replaced by two and two. And yeah, uh, how do we compute the X? So the X is computed uh, in the ways that it starts at this minus 1.5 and we add to it the position of x that is given by 1 to uh, by 0 to 900 resolution minus 1 so just for you to see what this number what this function actually do i will execute of these commands and i will go right directly inside the function so you can see those numbers. So you can see now the DC has the real component two and the imaginary component two. And this one to resolution minus one will actually create a vector that goes from zero to 999. So this is a little bit of a trick because normally in R, if we get one to resolution, we would get one to 1000. When we get this minus one, it will do the minus one on both or on the whole vector. So we go from zero to 999. And then uh, at this point, when I execute, okay, when I execute this command, I will actually get uh, the X that will be, uh, again, a vector of all, all those position of X as it moves. And the same we will get for Y. Now with this command outer, um, So it's through like this. So when I ask for outer, outer will create actually all the combination of X and Y. So, so we will get all of the combination of, of that image that we want to compute for the bundle broad set. So, so in this case, what is in the points will be is uh, the the object points uh, will be a, a large matrix that will have dimension one thousand to one thousand, and it contains all of those 
uh, starting points of C here that we need for the mandal broad. Then we will uh, pre-allocate the metrics for the output because for R, when we want to use those uh, four cycles, it's best if we can pre-allocate the object and then just change the values of, of the objects. And this works okay for the matrices. If you use the data frames, it actually would not work that well because in data frames, it always copies the whole columns when replacing even one value. So I, the yeah, we can do this for the matrix. It wouldn't work for, for the data frame. So in here, we pre-allocate, this will be an empty matrix. So it's like results for, uh, results for, will just be now just matrix that's 1,000 to 1,000 that is full of NAs. Yeah, there are NAs by design because we want to be sure that when we have numbers there, that are actually the outputs. And then we have two four cycles that go from one to 1,000 for X and Y. And we run this Mandelbrot set uh, computation for each of the points that we defined here before. And we add, get the result into uh, that output matrix. So now, um execute all of these commands. Are there any questions at this point? Is this kind of clear to everybody? Looks so. Okay. Great. So now it is easy. Now we just can compute, you know, the bundle broad set by executing this for loop where we pass all of the parameters that we set up here at the at the top it will take i don't know probably something like 10 seconds and after we got the results we can visualize them so we will prepare the space here in the viewer so for the visualization i chose to use the Plotly library. It creates interactive graphs. And the reason to use it is that it's actually very easy to create a heat map with it because we just need to define the parameter Z. And when we send a metrics inside, it will give us the image, the heat map. So, so now we can see the results. So, so this is the Mandelbrot set that we were computing. It comes from theory of chaos and fractals. Uh, it is very, very amazing thing. And we can see that um, here we have a lot of values 100. Here we have a lot of values like 1, 2, 3. And then at, at, at these edges, we, we got some differences that we go uh, from uh, those ones to to one hundred, you know, and that can create very interesting color depending on how you visualize the results. Now, we will get to the phase where we said, okay, so what we've done here, we use the two four cycles, and uh, in those two four cycles, we actually executed a function that has another four cycle in it. Um, what we can do, uh, okay, one thing we can do right now is that in our studio, in, for quite some time, there is a profiler uh, or there is a tab for profiling, better to say, there is a tab that uh, lets you profile code in R. So if you want to know which part of the R code is actually slow, you can just go to here to the profile and you can click here on profile selected lines. So we do not have the profiler installed, but you can click here. It will ask you to install the profvis package. So the profiling on this tab is done through the profvis package. I will click yes to install it. Okay. 
because of course, before we want to do any kind of optimization, the good practice is to actually find out where the core problem uh, is and why the computation is slow if we want to make it faster. And profiling is the way how to actually do that. We could use uh, things like pick and talk, like we seen yesterday with Yanis, but it uh, means that we would have to put it in every part of the code and that is quite cumbersome. So there are some tools that can do help us a little bit more on that way. And for that exactly that's what the profilers are meant for. Now, in this case, we have uh, several different visualizations of the results. Yeah. Uh, one thing is that we will not see much inside on the flame graph, but when we go to the data graph, we should be able now to go a little bit inside and be and Thomas, it has maybe you ask uh, if everybody managed to install Profiler. Ah, okay, yeah. Because so, I tried this again and uh, it is still an installation. So I don't know now since we are many of users. So everybody managed to do this Profiler installation. The question, okay, okay, please. Okay, yeah, I think yes. Obviously, I need to repeat this. Oh, it no, it is. Be... Oh, okay, no, it's fine for me. Too. Yeah. Okay, it seems to be working for the people who follow it. Yeah. You know, sir, so yeah, so now we got this tree structure, and the thing that we see is uh, that actually. In the this prof this prof this is the whole uh, this expression that we had selected, and after that we have those four loops, and after that we can see the call to the Mandelbrot function, and then there are some calls to the garbage collector, but it doesn't matter that much in this case. So those four loops that we see will be actually these outer four loops that we can see. And then we have the under broad call. So we know that most of the problem for us is happening in the under broad because uh, the under broad itself took like 16,450 milliseconds. And these numbers above it are always accounting the numbers that are underneath it, you know, so when we open something like this, uh, this is the sum, this should be the sum of the all the numbers underneath it. And there might be a little bit of some overhead by the functions themselves. That's why the number can be higher, you know? So, uh, because I think it, it will be somewhat higher. There is some overhead of the function itself, but it usually, it is very close to the sum of the all the numbers underneath it in that next level. So what we do first right, right now is just rewrite this part, this Mandelbrot function into C. And you will see it's very, very simple. So when we go down here beyond the plotly, uh, this is all of what that we need to do. We will call the RCPP library and call the CPP function. Then the input for this function actually is a string, and the string should contain the CC function that we want uh, to be exported. So, as I was saying before, for in C code, we need to specify what the output of that function should be. In, the, in this case, the output is a scalar number. So we can put here e I and T, what is, stands for integer, and it's the single integer. Uh, 
we have here the name of the function. So I called it Mandel. And then we define the parameters pretty much the same way as in R. Only thing is that, again, we need to define what should be the input uh, type data types. So in our case, we want to input here double as a real and double as imaginary number. Uh, potentially this could be replaced with the type complex, but I think uh, it wasn't working that well for me. So I, I stick to having two doubles and then actually creating a complex number inside of the function. And the third parameter is integer for max inter C. So this real and im are actually the real part and imaginary part of that C uh, that we have here. No. So when defining variables in C, it is actually much more cumbersome that, than with R because R simplifies a lot of these things. But what we can do then is define the complex number. So this is one of the data types in C that's uh, used for complex numbers. So we use the STD library and this its type complex double. Uh, the variable is called C and the real part is then defined by this double that is real. Uh, yes, exactly. So see it in the question right now. So these uh, these are the names of the variables that are doubles. And then we put those variables here in, in, in this is actually uh, the constructor of the complex number, uh, the variable that will be a C, and this is the real part, the imaginary part. Then we create one, another complex uh, number that will be Z and it will, uh, the first iteration is the same as C, so we just put here equals C. Uh, you can see that again, we, we need to put the semicolon at the uh, end of the every statement in C code. And then we define this for a uh, cycle. These four cycles in C are similar to some degree in the, those in R, but the one difference is that we are actually here creating a variable. So we need to also define its type since we want to iterate over it, uh, it's best to use integer. In C, we are indexing from zeros, not from ones. And as in R, so we usually use that we start with i equals zero. Then we have a semicolon. We have here a stopping condition. So in our case, the stopping condition is that i must be less than maximal iteration. It is less because we are starting at zero. If we start at one and we want to make 100 iteration, it would have to be equals less or equal to, for example. And here we have another semicolon. And this part of the for statement tell us what to do after each iteration. So we will add one to, to y. Uh, so yeah. Uh, after execution of, of these these expressions, this i plus plus stands is the same as when we use the i equals i plus one in R. In many other languages, there are these shorthand commands like i plus plus, for example. So this is our for loop, and in that for loop, we practically do exactly the same thing as in R. So the z will be equal z times z plus c. And then we just uh, test for, for the condition whether the distance of that complex z number is greater than two. If yes, we will return i. If not, uh, we will iterate over all of it and then return max iteration. So we can see this is very similar to, to the code that we have here in R. 
there are some more things uh, that, that comes from C, but overall, I think it's very, very similar. So now, and here's the thing that if we define really this as a function in normally in C, we would usually be need to have some, some, some more things like importing libraries and so on. By default, the C++ function imports the RCPP library and uh, some basic required libraries as this STD. Uh, then there are some uh, parameters that can let us also, you know, import some other libraries as needed. But we will not delve that deep into it. I think this is really what we need for many simple improvements that can be done in, in, in R. And now we just execute this command and we should see that we will have this Mandel function magically appear in our environment. And we can already use it as, uh, as an R function. Yes. So write something like one one here, and it, it returns zero for that case. Uh, then for the second part, we will need to we will use again pretty much the same function as before. So so this function is the, just the copy of the function that we have here, the for loop. I only thing that will change. And there's a change in here is actually the call to the function. So here, instead of calling the Mandel broad function, we will call the function Mandel. And we will put those real part and imaginary part of C in here. So there were almost no changes to this. So now I will also execute this function. Uh, so so I have it here for loop C, and I can execute the computation. Those who want, here is also code for visualization. I commented it out. And here we are checking whether the results are the same with the old the equal function. And we can see we have the same results. Uh, from the out for and our new function out for C. Uh, so I'll just comment this out. And I will run this micro benchmark. So to test uh, the speed up of our functions, I actually use Uh, yes, it will all equal will test uh, each uh, element on the matrices one to the other at the same indexes. So you can see even more when we open the help on that. Um, it should be this one. Is it like utility to compare R objects X and Y testing the near equality? If there are different comparison is made to some extent and report on, on the differences. It, it, is, it works for different types of objects. So it's, it's very good to use. And it is better than use the identical because uh, it should co also take into the account the, you know, uh, those small differences by representation of doubles in, in the computers where identical is actually really comparing uh, all, all of the digits. And then it may say that something is not identical out of com the computer sense, we could say that it is identical. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, to be honest, I don't remember exactly now whether there is a way Maybe there is even a way how to, yeah, how to set the tolerance. So by normal, the tolerance is machine double apps. But if you need to change the tolerance, you can even do that. 
So it's a really nice function to to know. Um, so for the benchmarking, I will use this uh, package micro benchmark that will execute the function several times. So you can see here we have the for loop uh, function uh, and we, here we have the for loop C function. We can name them. So in the output, then we will have the for loop and for C. Uh, and we can define the number of times that this should be executed. Since the for loop takes quite a lot of time, I, I set the times to two. And we and we execute this, we will get uh, this nice, really nice comparison of the speed up. Okay, this will take, I don't know, about half a minute, right? So, Wait a little bit. Yeah. And now we can see it just by replacing the inner function here uh, as, as we've done it. Uh, our ex execution was is now better by something like five times. So I think this is pretty impressive and it was not much of a work, right? We can make another step in this optimization. And that is that we, you, you see, we use those two for loops here still uh, to find the function. So we have still here those two for loops and the creation of the whole uh, imaginary initial, co initial condition, initial points. So we can also replace uh, that whole part and create this whole C solution for computing this image. And we have that in the next step. So now what we do differently is that we define this function Mandelbrot and the output is actually integer matrix. So this integer matrix is not the standard uh, data type that you see in V. This is brought to us by RCPP. And yeah, and it works pretty well. So we can uh, define that the output is integer matrix. For the inputs, we will use the resolution with the max iteration. And yeah, actually now you can see that we can have also the complex numbers as an input. So so here they are used and I'm pretty sure it works. So so that's good. So even in the year before, I think I created it when uh, st starting here, we could replace this double real and double imaginary directly with this part with the double uh, complex double C data type and then we would, would have one to one function. But nevertheless, so here I am, have this C min and C max. Uh, uh, pretty much what is happening is, uh, here is that we again compute this uh, different C and uh, then we pre-allocate that integer matrix. So this is constructors from the RCPP. So this integer matrix will be called out. And when we just put here resolution, it will uh, fill it out with zeros and it will be a square that will be resolution by resolution. Uh, yeah. you, uh, these constructors have can have more parameters and then you can define really the size of the metrics and the input values inside, but we do not need that. Uh, difference here to our R solution is that we, we, uh, we do everything now here in, in those two for loops. So the for loops are beginning actually here. Then I am creating here the helper functions, uh, helper variables. So that, uh, because uh, we have integers here and this is one of the troubles again with the data types in C, in some other languages that we defined 
i as an integer and when we are computing what should be the initial value of c we do this uh, division of by the resolution and multiplication by the real part of the difference uh, of the dc and if we kept this as an integer even if we put double here this operation will be executed for integers and we get the result of zero so we need to uh, cast uh, this i to make it a double uh, by defining with new helper uh, yeah helper var variable and we do the same for j so this this is what is happening on these two lines then we compute the real and imaginary part of the c uh, so this is pretty much the same as what is happening here, but here we predefined the whole thing. And then we went over it. Thinking about it, maybe we could just compute it directly here. I'm not sure what would be better, to be honest. Because in, in this way, we do it kind of the R vectorized way. But I know, yeah, I haven't tested it. But so then we define the, the the C and we define Z. So now already at, the, at this point, we are actually in that uh, we are getting to to this inside of the Mandelbrot function. That, so we are, we are already here here. Yeah, define C and Z equals C. So this is pretty much the same here. And then. Uh, we cannot use for in this case because the way how this works was that we had a for and that for was stopped by this return since we called the function. But when we are writing it in, in this fun uh, robust function, we actually need to use while instead of for and uh, Test for the condition whether apps is uh, this distance of z is less than two, and the iteration is less than max iteration. So when one or the second conditions is broken, then this while loop will stop, and uh, we keep the number of iteration that happened, and then the number will be then put into that matrix out that we define here at the beginning. So I think it's not that difficult, but it may be overwhelming seeing it for the first time. So is everybody still keeping up with me? Okay, yes, okay. That's positive. <laughs> Great, thank you. So now we can again call this rccp function and here in our environment a new function mandelbrot will be created um, to compute yes the values that we plot are the values of iteration so when we when we look at these codes before, it's it is pretty much the same, but maybe it's not uh, that explicit because here we have the the iteration if it happens in this for loop, and we return i when this condition happens, um, and we return the max iteration if if it hasn't happened in the for loop. And here it is probably a little bit more explicit that we are counting the iterations and when one of these conditions is broken, then uh, we add that value to, to the matrix. Ah, so I will run it again. And now we can just run the Mandelbrot that has the exact same inputs as our for loops. And we will see that its compute is much faster. We, again, I will use this all equal to check whether the values are the same. So we can see the values are the 
same and I will run this computation here. This will take some time again. Um, so in the meantime, for those of you who came a little bit later, what you can do if you haven't done so is open the project here, the Parallel Air May 2024, go to the Git tab and click on the blue arrow that goes down to pull the updates of that Git. For those who are very fine with terminal, you can do the same thing in the terminal by going to the parallel may and just calling the git tool. Uh, so it depends on you. Both, both approaches will work. The thing is that I added some files today to the second day. So you may see those. Okay, so now the computation finished and we can see, so we started with the for loops at something the over 20 seconds, is that right? Probably yes, yeah. With the changing just the inner loop, we got to the four seconds and then with the whole C solution that we had at the end, we got to half a second uh, on the execution. So I think this is really, really cool. And you can see that it is really, really simple to, to get these functions into, into your code. So right now, for those of you who updated your Git, when you go to the second day, I prepared two exercises. They are quite easy, so... I think you could you could um, you should be able to do that. I will give you now like I don't know 13 minutes to 14 15 to try to do it by yourselves or yeah maybe maybe just 10 minutes <laughs> and then I will start go go over these. So these are pretty simple. So in the exercise one, we have some parameters here. We have defined a logistic map that looks something like this. Um, again, I will pre-initialize vector beforehand, uh, set the first iteration of the vector, and the logistic map is computing just by iterating this uh, me times x times one minus x and give it as a new value of x. And in this case, I, the whole history is being kept by always having the value here in uh, putting it in the out vector. And here is part of the skeleton prepared. So you do not have to worry about the data types. Only thing that you actually need to add here is uh, what, uh, to be honest, this part, you know, so adding the X as a first value and this for loop. So I think you, you could handle it easily, at least most of you here. And there are some pointers about C to, to remember. And in the second exercise, uh, this is a little bit different thing. So here is created a matrix. And in R, you use apply uh, to compute mean of each column. So we can use apply, put the matrix there, choose two for the indexing. So we said by these two that we want to go by columns and the operation is mean. Again, we can write it in RCPP. Uh, the output should be a numeric vector. The input is numeric matrix. In this uh, variable n call is actually already the number of columns computed for you from the matrix. And the numeric vector is pre-allocated. 
in this case, we cannot use apply functions on the matrix, but you can do a for cycle uh, by calling mean function, and you can really call the mean functions the same way as in R on the columns of the matrix in four. So you just call the mean uh, and the columns are indexed by this way. So I think you should you you should be able to to figure it out. If not, I will tell you in a few minutes how to do that. Oh yeah, that's the important thing. So you should delete those three dots so then at some point and replace them with the content if that wasn't obvious. I went to, to saying that there should be something. It is not explicitly stated anywhere. Uh, be sure that we make everything today. Uh, I will start explaining the solution here slowly. So, as you can see, first thing we need to do is uh, at the first value, put the value of x. Uh, as is, I mentioned several times, uh, in C, we are indexing from zero. So we start without square bracket zero. Uh, we use equal because those arrows are probably used just in R, but we can use uh, equal sign here and then we use X and don't forget the semicolon. Then we start with the for statement. We need to define uh, the data type. Ah, we need to define, oh, we already initialize out that, so that's fine. And here we start with EI equals uh, one actually. So because we skip the first iteration as we set that value uh, before the loop. And then uh, we go up to the number of iterations. So I should be less than there. And we go with I plus plus. We use composite brackets, and here we first replace the value of x. Here we use exactly the same writing as in R, so x equals me times x times uh, minus uh, one minus i minus x at at out position i we assign the value of x and again don't forget the semicolons i think this should be it see if i got it right uh, all of these and execute those values so we can see it if outputs are all equal, so this is how the solution should look like. I will keep it for a few more seconds. See. And I will also run the benchmarks and yeah, uh, thing is that here is the maximum. Uh, I think this has something to do with all those linking and first calling the C C call. Uh, I, I'm not actually, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure at the moment, but the, I think this might happen. But the usually we are something like seven 
times faster, almost eight. This is the first exercise. For the second exercise, I guess this is a little bit more difficult, but we will start again with the same definition of uh, four. We will go up to number of columns. This is standard and here to the output at I, we will assign the mean of the input uh, as the, uh, of the column. So as I wrote here, this is how you actually get the values of the EI column of the matrix um, with the RCPP. And I think this should be it. This one, and I made a mistake somewhere. Okay, semicolon. There's something more that I... Uh, yeah, and I haven't defined the data type in the eye. So, only now it will work. This seems to be working now. Execute. All thing. And let's see whether we got the same results. So we can say we have the same results. So again, I will be show it to you for a few more seconds. So pretty much this this line is the important thing here. It is pretty easy, but one needs to read through the manual of the RCPP to understand these special data types brought by RCPP and how to work with them. But again, when I run the micro benchmark, we can see that in this case, the speed up is not that great. Maybe if I increase the size. Um, really, but we are getting to something uh, like three times faster still. So, yeah. This was for how to easily do with this RCP. And now let's go to the second part. And that is this example with CUDA. So first thing first, let's go to the terminal and let's call those scripts Mount Barbora and then something. Ah, okay. Seems that I do not have that scripts because I call it, yeah, I had it as a Mount Carolina, but I think I rewrote it. Huh. So in, in your case, it should be a Mount Barbara as this one. No. I already ran it yesterday with Diana, so I hope there will be no trouble with that. One important thing here is that we need to copy the R CUDA folder to to that mount folder after you mount the
to know how we copied it. Okay. It doesn't work the way as I expected it. Uh, it was working just for the, the files, right? So, so maybe what they want to do instead. can do is try to execute instead this command into the terminal hopefully it will work for you you should execute it in the terminal of the virtual machine and after that you can log into Barbara and check whether you see the that folder there. So first I will try to go over the files that we have here. So this R2 CUDA is prepared as very minimal package of R. Um, for those of you who know how to do packages in R, if you have see, know that if you need to have these description and namespace files in there. So in the description, there is the package name and there are other things that you can see usually on CRAN describing the package uh, that are not really built out in this case and there are some defaults from the skeleton important thing is that it imports rcpp and there is linking to rcpp this needs to be here for the rcpp to work and i will get back to the namespace later and then I think it will go from here. So in the minimal version, we need to have these uh, some kind of that .cpp file in the source where we will have um, this expo rcpp export and function name. Uh, what we could have also instead of this one is something like this. This RCPP export. Okay. Forgot the name now, but you know, in front of the function. And here you can see in this way, we are using this more uh, original way of working with, uh, with R. Okay, maybe I should ask, do, do everybody who wants to follow along with, with running the code has this R2 CUDA copied to Barbara? Uh, you should ask about that first. Okay, I see yes from Maria. This from Lorenzo, great. So uh, I will get back to, to this explanation. So now we can see something very similar to what we had before. We have some input parameters here. And uh, in this case, these are the pointers that are then converted to actual values by this RCPPS in, in uh, resolution. 
I think it should work probably also the same way as we had it before. And I might test it if we have time, but we do not have that much time. So let's see, I will speed up a little bit. But anyway, these are just the parameters. We will make an integers from them. And then we have this mandelbrot main function that is def defining the CUDA file. Uh, its output is a vector. And that vector is then returned back to R. In this case, we are writing here that we are returning the pointer. So we use the RCCP wrap around it to convert it to to that r object um, what you can see here is that we are including the rcpp headers in case of barbara we wrote here the whole path exactly to the rcpp header that we will use uh, here are the includes to standard io library and Actually, since this function is defined in another file in, in this folder, we need to add also this kernels header. That is the file here. That is pretty much just describing us the data types of that function. Uh, you know, used libraries and so on. The, this is just the way in C how to make uh, possible to run these functions don't go into the details. And we need to have this using namespace RCPP. That is so we can use this RCPP as integer and RCCP wrap functions and so on. So this is really just a, a CPP file that works for us something like an intermediary file for communicating with R. And if we do not use CUDA and we would just make want to make a library, we could have just this file instead. And do not we would not need to uh, worry about these headers and make vars and CUDA file, to be honest. So it could be as easy as that. And now I will open the how this Mandelbrot CUDA file looks like. And uh, yeah, here you can choose the C++ for the highlighting if you want, because it will work well. Here again, we import the uh, RCPP headers, some other libraries from C and RCPP. This is actually taken from this page. And if you would open this page, there are also some more improvements to this code. Uh, you would also see that the code we use is very, very similar to it. So yeah, here is some adaptive parallel computation with CUDA. So what I've done is just I came here and I, I copied these functions. I kicked out everything from these functions, or I think I copied this one here. Uh, I kick out everything related to actually plotting it, because usually when you find the C library or C, C codes to Mandelbrot, it contains also the plotting functions that we do not need. And then I just uh, adjust it. Uh, actually, there are two functions in here. So we were calling the Mandelbrot main. And if we go over it, you would see it is very similar to what we had, uh, maybe. But there are some differences because since, since this is a CUDA code, it has uh, also some specific to the CUDA. We need to create uh, vectors and allocate CUDA memory. What happens in this line, we will allocate a vector here on the host memory. That's That will be the Barbara computer. Then uh, on CUDA, you actually define uh, 
you have these blocks that are being computed in parallel and you you uh, and the grid and you kind of define defining how in our case the pixels uh in in what kind of blocks in parallel they should be computed i wasn't touching that code so it might not be optimal for the hardware that we have on the barbara but it doesn't matter that much because it will still work very well <laughs> and uh, uh, that that is happening actually here. You know, here here is some computation about uh, how how those uh, reads are uh, divided and so on, and the memory allocated. But uh, I don't want to trouble you too much with these things because we really do not need to worry too much about that. Uh, here you can see that uh, this is the call to the actual function. This part is actually telling the GPU how to divide that computation. And here are the input parameters. So this is the actually the vector from, yeah, the allocated vector from the uh, GPU. Here is the resolution. So this is width and height. In our case, it's uh, we had just resolution, so those values are the same. Uh, this is the C min. So you can see that it's the complex value one, minus one point five minus one. So it is hard coded in this code. I wasn't adding those parameters to the main function. And this is the C max. And max dwell is actually max iteration that we had in our code. So you can see now, now this is calling pretty much the same function as we had created. If you wanted to go into the details, you could just see what is happening in those two functions above, but they are pretty much uh, the same thing that we had. Uh, I, I won't go over, over it anymore because as I said, it, it, this would take probably quite a while to go into detail and I might even not tell it uh, totally correctly, I think. But the important thing is that in this code, I took most of it the same. I think I had to just change the return value to, to be this STD vector that is copied here at some point, you know, and that's pretty much it. That vector is copied here, and that vector is then passed back to R in this function that is just do, doing the call to the CUDA Mandelbrot. That's how easy it is. And now if we want to test it, we should do yeah, this call. So I will put this into the chat. Uh, Diverging to yesterday, yesterday we were executing a batch script. Today, if you want to go along with me, you can copy this call, this this command into the Barbara, and you get an interactive session. Cute. This doesn't work. Maybe we need to ask for a reservation to get a job. So. Try to find the name of the reservation. It's usually quite empty, so it's not necessary. Let's see whether this works better. Okay, so I, I update the command with the reservation here. When you copy this one, you should get the note right away. So now we are on the node with a GPU. It should have this NVIDIA SME command. And on with that one, we can see we have like four GPUs here. Uh, although just one of those should belong to us. Uh, now, I 
thing. I forgot one more thing. So one last file that I haven't gone over to is this make vars file. And this is something people working with C might know this is um, similar to this is not really a make file, but to to, to those make bars file. I don't remember now what was the equivalent name in C. But it it's uh, pretty much just defines how uh, what compilers to use and what options the compiler should use, and just the important thing about the when using the CUDA is that we need to define how to compile those CUDA files with NVCC, what is compiler for CUDA code, and add the right flags to that one, so so it compiles. Yeah, uh, again, I won't go into detail into this because we would have to go through the whole lot of intro of C and compiling and so on. Uh, just important takeaway is that there is this make var file that is defining all the paths to the libraries and what commands should during the installation of package be executed to compile individual files there. Now, what we can do with our R to CUDA is we should call the commands ML, uh, R, and CUDA. So this will load the libraries of R and CUDA into our computational node. And now we can run the R command build R to CUDA. So I will copy everything into the chat. No, this one, this one. This command should create for us uh, the target file of the package. And now when we run the R command install R2 CUDA targis, it should compile those two files. Yeah, everything looks fine. So we see that the R2 CUDA was installed. And actually, I realized I need to copy one more file, and this is the file called ctest with a Barbara. Uh, looking at the RC test, there is the bundle brought in the C and setting this uh, resolution to the 1000, the same as before, and it will run the micro benchmark on C and with the CUDA. So script and I run now the R script on this C test. And oh okay so I will go directly to R and see what is the problem. CUDA Mandelbrot not result from current namespace R2 CUDA. Okay, so it's unexpected. It's my fault for touching. These things, so I will remove this one and try to build the package again. Build Arch Buddha. It's 
testing it two days ago and it was working. So it should work. Okay. Um, so the script is running now actually, and you can see we have a difference in in the outputs. And most, most points are the same, and there were some points that are not the same. I was trying to figure it out, and to be honest, I'm not sure, but it is really just several points that are different. You can see the first and third quartile are still like zero difference, and there were just a few points that were different. But overall, uh, the picture from the uh, uh, CUDA looks the same, but we can see that uh, compared to our C solution, the one running on CUDA is much more faster. So it was running in five milliseconds compared to 422 milliseconds on pure C, we've known parallelized. So has anyone else managed to run this thing? Okay. Troubles. No permission to install directory. It's very weird. I don't know why. It tries to install your library. To, to the folder of the R. Um, so let's see, I, I, do, I do not have this in my hand, but um, you can try one another thing and that is go to R, write install packages, um, Let me like do CUDA of this. Think in, in this case, if you install it like this from R, it should ask you whether to install to the user library. Or we can just um, see. Okay. I see. So you, you you could try to do something like this. Yep. There is no writable. No, I would expect it. Yeah, that you you would get this question, and then you can un just answer yes, and it will install in your personal library. Or to to figure it out. So how it is personal. Library Linux because there's, there is some default part that I do not have in my head. So the parts. You know, on this lib path, I would expect you would you would have part something like this. Just the username would be the DD twenty three one sixteen something. 
uh, but if you do not have that in your lip parts, then should able. Set it up. You manage to just somehow do this. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think you might try is go out of R, make directory, let's call it R lip. Go back to R and do that install packages R2 CUDA and targets and not to this R lip, I think it should work. You, you first need to create a folder in your home directory for the library. Then there's one more step and that is that in that The C test, you should actually call to R to CUDA and then the go with the R lib. So it's like R lib. R. It's um packages to put everything Yes, and I, I put into the chat now what should help you. <laughs> this work. So and we can just see that for the the SCUDA we can actually go to very very large pictures and it will still work very fast. Oh so Teaser. Ah, uh, okay.
on it is so good. Uh, one thing is the the CUDA is returning uh, it's returning a vector so it needs to be changed into the matrix but even for these like 10,000 with 10,000 iteration, the time is like 0 0.5 seconds. Uh, you can believe me that even if you run the C code in sequential, we will not see the end of it. Um, anyway, I think this is all from my side. So I'm just waiting here for people who want to try it by themselves to, to debug it for the others. If you not have no more questions, thank you very much. I hope you find this helpful and learn something new. And yeah, maybe we'll see each other on some other training in the future.